You're listening to The Valley Current. Historically existed that has allowed these universities to give more weight based on race. Is that something that is going to continue with this court or is that something that's going to end? And so you, you might say all this starts with Brown versus Board of Education, pretty important decision overturning the separate but equal regime that existed under Plessy versus Ferguson. That was in 19, I want to say 19, uh, Brown was, I think, a 1954 case. Plessy was a much earlier case. So they do reverse themselves. And this was actually something that was pointed out in the Dobbs decision, which is, yes, there are times when we make mistakes too. You know, we're not, we're not infallible. And so uh, what we have is this body of, of constitutional law that looks at this, what's called this two-step examination known as strict scrutiny, which is if the type of racial classification is one that gets strict scrutiny, then you have to look at whether there's a compelling governmental interest that somehow overrides the strict scrutiny principle. And, you know, there's lots of little detailed formulations of that approach against different types of classes that get different levels of scrutiny. But race is one of them. And you might say, well, so what's the problem here? Well, the problem here is that other people feel as though they're getting discriminated when race, such as being black, leads to people getting their applications to have greater weight. And therefore- Are you, are you arguing with that conclusion or, or do you accept it? No, I, I, think, I think I accept the view that as a general proposition, education, is probably a better way to deal with historical discrimination that unquestionably has existed in the United States since even be well before the Civil War and well after it, and maybe even arguably right to this day. Um, there's other interesting observations I'll, I'll make about that. I mean, I, I am amazed compared to Northern California, how many mixed race couples there are in florida uh, a southern state um you know one of the one of the first southern states to become a member of the united states um and you know slavery was big in florida for a long period of time and yet it seems like there's actually more diversity and inclusion i don't know if there's equity but there's certainly diversity and inclusion in the state of Florida than what I see and have seen historically in Northern California. But that's kind of a footnote observation to the story of, you know, you can be a more Republican state, which I guess Florida is. I think it's a close 50-50, but let's call it Republican. It typically votes Republican. And compared to California, which typically votes Democratic, and yet actually have more non-discrimination going on at least based on what you observe in the street. But getting back to, to students for fair admissions and, and versus Harvard, um, you know, there, there's a lot of historical law here that the court goes through in like a 237 page decision, which I'm, I'm kind of amazed that they don't have somebody that applies Occam's razor to really cut this stuff down because when you have a decision that that that's that long uh it's really hard to to absorb what is the common thread that's playing out in the court's actual decision making and it gets even more confusing when you have various concurring opinions that certain people join other concurring opinions that other people file and don't join and then you have again this group that's sort of like as far as i remember uh all of the justices who, who voted to strike down fair, the the existing admissions policy all six of them joined in robert's decision and that will be what makes the law 
I agree with you that I didn't quite see the point in Kavanaugh's separate concurrence and all that, but I don't think it's going to matter in the long run. Right. And and just to give some numbers, because I wanted to get them out there, which is that Harvard says it gets over 60,000 people applying for 2,000 seats. So, you know, that if you do the, the quick math on that, that's like 1.6% of the applicant pool. So they've got to essentially cut 98.4% of the applicants out and giving yes, weight, giving and do it in such a way that the racial composition of the incoming class doesn't vary from that of the previous class and the right. tools they use to do that are shot through with bad faith well tell me what you think because i can imagine that there is a a strange way this sausage gets made that is almost trade secret or historically may have been sort of secret i don't know that it's secret anymore there's a lot of detail in the 237 pages about how they rank people and how they cut and how they do this and how they do that and I, I have to say, I think there's probably a lot of other backdoor stuff that happens in what they call the final stage, which is called the lop off or LOP, during yeah. which the tentatively admitted students are winnowed further to arrive at the final class. I mean, that's from the decision. It's It's got to be viewed as something that they think is sacred. And here's the court huh. throwing I'm a laughing standard. because, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the court throwing a spanner into the gearbox, but I don't know if that really causes any damage to the gears, frankly. I, I wonder if it really is going to change anything or it's just going to result in some different ways in which they document their file going forward, because this is a pretty hot issue and one that's probably not going away. The comparative numbers, just to finish this thought, at the University of North Carolina in a typical year, they get north of 40,000 applications for maybe about 4,000 seats. So it's more like 10%, which means they've got to cut 90%. But still, those are big, those are big numbers. Uh, Harvard obviously is far more selective, uh, but University of North Carolina still is top 10%, presumably, and it's not necessarily the top 10% academically in either place. Far from it. And that's and that, now let me do my, my little shtick. I was saying that it shot through with bad faith, and I meant two things by that. The first thing is the racial composition, but there's a second thing, which it, and there's an acronym for it. The acronym means athletes, legacy, donor related, and faculty related. Okay. And the second thing is what made me laugh. But let me do the first thing first and then get to the second thing. Okay. So we had pre baki you had straight racial quotas. It was true when I was at Michigan. It may have been true when you were at UCLA. Right. That's what was struck down at Bakke. And Bakke was an art case. This case has a strong majority opinion behind Roberts. Bakke did not. There were four against using race. There were four in favor of race. Lewis Powell was in the middle. No one joined, as far as I remember, his opinion, but his opinion governed because it created the majority. And his opinion was, no, you cannot use race to remedy past discrimination or remediate the history of racism and on and on. You can use it to create diversity. So that's where we got the diversity from. Everybody had to bow down to the diversity God, okay? And but what it really meant in practice, whatever Lewis Powell may have thought, whatever it meant in practice was we want to keep as much as possible of the pre bakke racial composition of our classes in being. And now we just have to find other ways to go about it. And the ways they found to go about it were shot through with bad faith. OK, so going on objective measurements, your LSAT score or for example, was not producing a racially diverse class. And in fact, black enrollment went down into the low single digits. And this could not be remedied by other objective measurements. There was a plan in Texas 
to admit the top 10% to the University of Texas, to admit the top 10% of every high school. And this would not explicitly use race, but it would mean if you're a black kid going to a, a high school only black, you've got a shot at being in that 10%, and then you're in. Okay, so they tried to do that, but it did not produce the racial result that they wanted. So they moved away from objective measures, whether the 10% rule or the LSAT, to subjective measures. And this is where you got the term holistic admissions from. So now the, and Harvard was brutal at this. So holistic meant that there was a subjective component to admissions decisions in which we look at the personality and the leadership qualities and the likability, believe it or not, of the students. And, and amazingly to say, all the Asian kids got lousy scores on personality. Now, <laughs> if that's not invidious racism, what the hell is? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was despicable. And it's not only despicable in and of itself, but it's a, an obvious blatant fraud. And having your public authorities or even your leading cultural institutions like Harvard engaging in blatant fraud is kind of bad. Yeah. And everybody knows it is. The yeah, second what? thing, there's a large exception to diversity. And it has to do with admitting students on the basis of athletics, whether they're legacies, in other words, the children of alumni, whether they're donor related. Let me say that in caps donor related or whether they're the children or faculty. And that accounts for 30% of the incoming class. And that's their business plan. They didn't get their $50 billion endowment out of thin air. It comes from legacy related and donor related admissions, period. That's their business plan and it's very successful. You sent me an article from Rolling Stone, no, no, not Rolling Stone, excuse me, Mother Jones. Mm -hmm. And the article said there are basically two legs to Harvard admission. The front leg is advancing diversity. The back leg is ALDC. And by front and back, I merely mean more visible and less visible, not more important, less important. Okay, the ALDC is actually more important. It takes in more admittees than all the affirmative action or diversity or what have you admit these put together. But that's where they get their money from and they're not gonna change it. For some reason, they want to preserve the facade of diversity and race consciousness and yada yada, I guess because they want people to think that they're wonderful, wonderful people. But to which I say, give me a break, really. And in order to preserve this facade, they do the most blatant racism in American life today. Well, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but they do blatant racism. I'll give the audience the acronym ADLC. What is it? A for athletic. A is athletic. L is legacy. D, is, the D, oh. it formally means dean's interest. The dean compiles a list of admittees is interested in, but or what it means is donor related. Okay, right. and C, children of faculty. Okay. But the interesting thing is, so when I first heard of this, I thought, okay, so there you get the basketball team. How many people is that? Six or eight or whatever it is. But no, this is 30% of the incoming class. And it's where they get their money from. So that's untouchable diversity or no diversity, but they don't want to say that. So then they do this rigmarole about holistic and personality and, and, but it's a sham and it's a shame that uses really dirty tactics. Right. And I guess the argument would be, Hey, if we can't compete for athletic talent, then the whole athletic department falls apart and that changes kind of the entire culture of the university, right? If they always have a losing team. Their business plan is wildly successful. Right, but you're saying- And, it, and they're it, not going to change it. But right, but, the objectionable part is who they they sacrifice to get to this. Right. They, what they do is they take perfectly stellar Asian applicants and tell them they've got crappy personalities. I mean, come on. Right, I mean, the point is that 
it's almost an impossible task to not be subject to some criticism. And this applies to employers as well. So we should talk a little bit about how this plays out in real life. Obviously, employers mm -hmm. are, are a different sort of breed and a different set of non-discrimination laws. But conceptually, uh, there are often too many applicants for a particular position, like CEO of a company. I mean, how many applicants could they get? I think if you look at LinkedIn, when they advertise for a CEO of a company, they'll often say in LinkedIn, like 4,000 people applied for this job, for one job, for one slot on LinkedIn. And obviously there's lots of other sources of resumes than LinkedIn. And so there's gotta be a decision made, presumably by the board of directors in the case of a private corporation or a public corporation for that matter. And in the case of a university, um, no, Harvard is a private university. University of North Carolina is a public university. I don't think that yes. the court really cares that much about the difference between private and public so far as this body of law is concerned, the equal protection law is concerned. Um, maybe there could be some arguments made. Maybe they have been made historically, but I think this decision more or less says it doesn't really matter whether it's public or private. And it gives a lot of, it still gives a lot of discretion as much as it's it's effectively saying we're changing the approach that we endorsed or that Powell uh, created in Baki and then we reaffirmed in, what was it, uh, Bruder? The Bruder. Case, Bruder as a Michigan law school case. So you're, you're alma mater. Uh, it seems like at the end of the day, they're still leaving a fair amount of leeway open to the way universities. Yes, and I'm not happy with the idea of taking one sham called uh, holistic and placing it with another sham called the essay. And I really don't see the point in going through that exercise. Let me say one thing about Bruder, since we've now touched on it. Uh, Senator Day O'Connor in Gruder said, Yes, racial, racial classifications are quite bad, quite dangerous. We're still doing it because we have to. We can't think about what else to do to get the result we want. But we should put a time limit on it. And in 25 years, it should be on its way out. That was not a statement of the law. I mean, it's not the law that it must die 25 years, 2003. But that was, that was the way she justified keeping these racial classifications in being. Did you believe at the time, and this is a set of questions, because the answer for me is no, I did not believe at the time that it would go out in 25 years. I thought, show the cat the way to the dairy. If we can get goodies by claiming diversity, then that's what we'll do and do much more of in the future. And that came to pass, did it not? Right. I mean, I have, I have to say, I never really thought that the Supreme Court should ever sound like it's legislating a time limit for how a particular constitutional principle is or isn't going to work. And think about that for a second, because if you really take... No, I'm not, I'm not saying that they should or that that was a good idea. I am saying that whether she was kidding herself or not, I knew as soon as I heard it that that was not going to work, that the opposite would happen. Right. I mean... It's it's sort of like when you think about different people talking about the U.S. Constitution, just to take a step back for a second, the Constitution is not a very lengthy document. If you really wanted to keep a, a paperback version in your pocket, it would be probably no more than, I don't know, 50 pages in a book. There's booklets available you can buy that have both the text of the Constitution and the, the Bill of Rights and the amendments going beyond the first 10 amendments. I forget the number that we're up to now, but the amendment process is, is very challenging to do because the number of states that have to agree, and we don't really have that level of agreement on anything to even have a constitutional convention. But the reason I'm raising this is the founders create a document that's designed presumably to be amended. I think they really believe that it would be amended about every 
20 to 30 years, maybe less, maybe more frequently, maybe less frequently. But we haven't really had um, a serious debate about how to go about amending the Constitution to deal with what we might say are some explicit things that we all imagine the Constitution should cover somewhat explicitly, like privacy rights and the like. We haven't really had that debate, almost because people think it's a big waste of time because there won't be a buy-in by the yes. states. And it probably it, it probably would be a waste of time. So that leaves to <laughs> nine that leaves to nine justices, um, several of which Trump got to a point, uh, got you know, basically starting with, as we said, Ruth B Bader Ginsburg deciding to not retire early enough for Obama to timely be able to select someone else. And then, of course, we have the way the Garland appointment was handled, which... That was way out of line, no question, way out right? of line. So there's a lot of politics about how these nine people end up getting onto the court. And are they... And this kind of gets to your point that we'll cover in more detail by the end, which is they're supposed to really debate in a serious way the principles of the U.S. Constitution without a lot of sniping or snarky behavior or snarky language. And it's supposed to be much more judicial. And for my money, I think the opinions need to be or should be a lot shorter uh, because I don't think citizens will read 200 Oh, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. I, I was amazed at the language that Gorsuch and Sotomayor used in 303 case about each other. It was amazing to me that, that they would actually write that way. To right. her credit, Elena Kagan does not do that. Right. So John so, Roberts does not do that. So right. to some extent, it's, it's crappy personalities, but I think the problem goes beyond crappy personalities. Right. And you could say it probably suggests effectively what some people call in the corporate environment, the dysfunction of the team, where teams are basically not uh, unified enough, even when they disagree as rivals or or as on a spectrum of different levels of liberal versus conservative thinking of how the constitution should be interpreted. They, they aren't taking their disagreement in a way that produces more light. They're taking it in a way that produces more heat. And for my money, that's not the Supreme court that gets a lot of respect. In fact, it's the Supreme court that I think, unfortunately, is getting more and more disrespect, certainly by various newspapers, various politicians. Leo and Thomas are not helping either, but I agree with you. Right. And so, you know, things like the leak of the Dobbs decision probably was inevitable because there is a level of animosity now that is creating a, a folks who just don't have a level of trust with each other in terms of trust and respect for the decision-making process. Uh, it might've been better, frankly, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg and um, who's the Italian guy who was on, on the court and then he was found dead in a hunting. Scalia? Game. Sorry? It must be Scalia. It Scalia. Must be. Yeah, Scalia and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg apparently used to get along and they're like on the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of liberal versus conservative. But they apparently were good friends. Yes, because they had something more important than ideology to bring them together. Because they loved Galeno. That's the case. Right. And so at some point, I think we're going to see um, some important scholars, and maybe we've already seen it, I just haven't seen it put in print, suggest that there needs to be some level of counseling provided to the justices about how they are impacting their credibility or their lack of credibility. And I'm sure Roberts has this on his mind because the court is not getting the kind of yeah, right. 
respect. And I think in many ways, that's probably the most damaging thing that's played out um, through the process that we've seen where new justices have come on board and the level of animosity has increased. And in general, I think to some degree, um, this this decision-making process that looks like it's just slamming a bunch of historical precedents that were viewed as sacred under principles of stare decisis, starting with the Dobbs decision and now kind of going forward with this series of decisions that you could argue are all pretty much reflecting a division in the country, but in a way that's even much more conservative than the Doesn't actual decision. Bring them together, yeah. exactly. Right. So, so what we have now is Doesn't is matter. some very lengthy opinions that seem a lot less judicial to me. They certainly seem a lot less academic. I don't know how these cases are going to be taught in first year or even elective constitutional law within. Uh, law schools, I'm not sure how they're going to get summarized, and I'm not sure how they're going to um, be harmonized with historical views about the way in which these doctrines work. But that said, I'm sure to a large degree, we're going to see more of it in the next few years, maybe as long as the next 10 or 12 years. So fair emissions is a very lengthy decision that gives a lot of data about how the selection process occurs, a lot of historical review, uh, starting with Brown versus Board of Education about how the court has created its equal protection doctrine, and then a lot of what might be called give with one hand or take with one hand and give with another, where net net the power of these committees to choose who is going to be uh one of the people in the 1.6 percent less than two percent that get admitted in in harvard to harvard and we're talking about the harvard undergraduate class but the same principles will apply to graduate students as well as law students um which are probably even more selective and then to uh, the public university, University of North Carolina, it's it's exclusion of 90 percent or inclusion of 10 percent. It's probably not really going to change the, the power. It's going to change the documentation and the way in which CYA, you know, cover your ass uh, uh -huh. mentalities um, uh, apply. And so I think it's disappointing that. Well, I've been critical. I've been, I've been quite critical of affirmative action, or my tone has been. But let me say that the key insight, which is the problem with racism, the problem is structural. In other words, because of this long history that everybody recognizes, black people have less financial capital and less social capital than other groups. And this has effects, and it's true. Okay, it's true. What I resent is trying to make other people and specifically Korean applicants, pay the price for that. If Harvard is so hot on correcting injustice, let them take a look at ALDC, but they won't do that. But that's my that's my real problem with Harvard. Not that structural racism does not exist or that we can sweep it under the rug. I agree with that. You know, I'll just drop a footnote here that I saw some interesting research uh, a while ago that said that part of the problem in terms of equality or lack of equality in uh, of minorities is that they haven't been able to purchase their first homes and get mortgages yes. and find down payments and that not getting yes, that's that, what I meant by financial capital right that get not getting on that financial elevator is really the source of a lot of the inequality because real estate has historically been uh, even beyond California throughout the nation, the sort of nest egg major investment that couples or households make and that results in the equivalent of a retirement fund in the equity of that real estate that gets built over sometimes as long as a 40 year 
a period of time that people will hold a house and have a mortgage on it or or have a refinancing and it's that lack of appreciation and then the the pass down effect that occurs in estate planning and so if if blacks and other minorities are mostly renters they never are on that elevator pit on that elevator now you could say well yeah but that's tied to education because if they get a better education oh, it is. It is. better job and in many ways when, when, uh, as, as you may remember i went to school in Bo i mean undergraduate in boston and that was at the time of the busing controversy and people in southie the irish neighborhood did not like black kids being bussed in or their kids being bussed to roxbury the black neighborhood but in the course of that to get to the point it turned out that the Roxbury schools had a budget of 200 in, in 1965 dollars, $240 per student. And the Southie kids had like 465 per student. Come on. I mean, it's indefensible. Come on. And of course that has effects. Right. So it could, it, it starts pretty early. Stay tuned to this episode of the Valley Current.